This is Fred Beck from Fred Dwight's High Team, proudly sponsored by Empire Fire Store. Today, I'm very lucky to be joined by Xavier Miller. So Xavier, you're joining me right now from Portugal. How's it out there? Uh, not too bad. It's not as hot as I'd like it to be, to be honest with you, but, um, you know, it's, it's better than the UK, though. Well, how warm is it out there now? Uh, it's, it's, it changes every day, honestly. Sometimes it feels like you, like you walk outside, you look in the sky, the skies are clear. And you're thinking, yeah, it's going to be warm, and then got to go back in and hold your jacket. So it just changes all the time. And then at night, it's pretty, it's pretty chilly. So, but you know, you don't really get the the rain or you know the that hard breeze like in the UK. So it's not too bad. Yeah, that must be quite nice having any rain like is over here in rainy old England. But obviously, you're doing the boxing coaching most of the time. But do you get any spare time to go off over the beach, surfing, anything like that at all? <laughs> I I don't like the beach. Really? Why not? I don't like the beach, um, but I have tried uh, oh, this boarding. It's only in the shallow waters, though. I can't remember what it's called. Like, it's one skimboarding. Guys, like, is, is it skimboarding? skimboarding. One the, yeah, one of the guys here is pretty good at it. So um, I, had, I had a go uh, one time. I've done a couple of little videos and said, right, that's enough for me. But um, that, that was a bit of fun, but I don't like the beach. I don't like sand in the toes and stuff. I'm not, I've never really been a beach person. What do you do when you're not doing the coaching then? What do you else get up to there in Portugal? All I do, honestly, all day is watch boxing. And, and I get slaughtered for it out here. Because, uh, you know, they, they're doing what they got to do. And it's like, hey, we're going here. You're going to come. Uh, I just want to watch boxing. I've been doing that since I was about 11 or 12. All my spare time is always watching boxing. I mean, my, my, my favourite era is, is the 90s. It is the 90s. So that's, that's all I do, man, honestly. Well, who are some of your favourite fighters from the 90s then, going back that way? I wasn't even alive then. Um, yeah, I liked, I liked Mosley. I liked uh, Ivan Robinson. I liked Evander Holyfield, Riddick Bowe. It's just too many. I, I, liked, I liked all, I liked, kind of like all the fighters around that time. Fernando Vargas was good. Winky Wright was good. I mean, kind of creeping into the early 2000s, but the 90s really was my, my time. Have you ever met any of them? Um, oh, I've met, I've met quite a few fighters now, but you see, I, I'm meeting them more now than back then. Cause when I went to America back then, I was very, very young. Um, you know, I have met my I, Ivan before, but again, I was, I was, I was young, really young. Um, never got to meet Evander, but yeah, I met a lot of guys, especially a lot of the UK guys as well. Cause I used to be in a lot of different gyms. Um, but you know, just glad to be meeting some of them now. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool, but I can imagine... Not many of them will be in Portugal, which is probably quite annoying. I guess you were based out in America. A lot of them will be coming. Say you're in Vegas, they'll be coming into the gyms. They have a gym, they're walking in and out. You kind of catch them then, or even at events and shows, presses. But in Portugal, I doubt they'll be, they'll be running up to you, you know, over there. But No, nah, Portugal Portugal's really? not really It's not really a boxing town, boxing city, really. It's not. Um, very quiet. You know, it's very quiet. So um, in that aspect, it's good to get away because... But it kind of suits me because of my personality, because I like to be home on my own watching boxing. This kind of suits my lifestyle. So it hasn't really affected me that much. It's just obvious that I miss my family and friends. But if we're talking like hobbies and spare time and stuff like that, this is ideal for someone like me. Yeah, Portugal, there being one day next year or on the year after I want to go. But you say you should probably move on to the one of the boxing sort of things. Um, Dillian White and Tyson Fury, we'll, we'll probably start there. What could be your overall thoughts on kind of the situation, the 80-20 split, all that sort of thing? Honestly, um, you know, I haven't really done it, any interviews because, you know, the fight, the fight's not signed. Um, I'm not really commenting too much on it at the moment. Uh, so, you know, listen, Dillian's got a very good legal team and they're dealing with it. You know, we're just, I'm just dealing with the training. So, don't really have much to say on the, on the Dillian White situation right now. But obviously, when the fight gets made, I'll have loads to say. <laughs> What percentage do you think it'll get made? A hundred being yes, and then a zero percent being no chance. What percentage do you think? It's just it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Legally, interim champion supposed to get forty five, but um, you know, in boxing, you know, people sometimes do what they want. So we just got to sit back and just wait and see, and hope they hope they're going to be fair, and so we can get a great fight. That's all we want, really. What was the kind of reaction in the camp? Kind of Dylan's reaction, your reaction. When the news broke about the 80-20 split? I, I have my own opinion, but I don't really discuss those things. You know, I kind of, I prefer to stay in my own lane. 
you know, I'm a boxing coach. Dillian's got a legal team to deal with those things. So it's my opinion on it. It's my opinion. It's just personal. Like, it's just, it is what it is. It's like, but as I was saying, because of the era that I've come from and the amount of time I've been in boxing, I, I've seen this happen time and time again. And I've spoke, I've had guys in the gym around me that have been through a, a similar situation like this. And um, because obviously the general public and the fans don't understand what actually goes on in boxing. Um, you know, you just wait for the fight news and that's it. But there's, there's a lot that goes on. And uh, but I never actually speak out, speak out about it. It's like to me, in the social media era is now actually overly involved in that part of boxing to me. Um, you know, we've seen that there's a lot of good boxing channels out at the moment because I listen to them all the time as well. You know, I like to hear their views and their opinions. Um, but a lot of the topics need to be based around splits and money and I'd rather you just talk about the fighters and who you think is going to win and you know talk about their resumes and stuff but that that seems to be a hot topic now um, so but you know it's part of it uh, it's just like I say I, I've had to get used to being on social media because I've got to use Instagram and Facebook and so on so I've had to evolve and change my mindset so I'm just kind of catching up with everybody else in that way Okay, I understand. And which boxing channels do you watch then, if you're watching them? Yeah, I, I listen, I like, there's a lot of them I like. Um, you know, Ego, uh, Blue Blood, uh, The Boxing Voice, you know, I listen to The Boxing Voice a lot as well. Um, but there's a lot of different ones, even the smaller channels, I, I, I like them. Um, you know, my, one of my friends, EJ, EJ Boxing, and uh, he's got his own channel. Um, you know, I like uh, Tunde and Spence's um podcast as well i listen to a lot of them i mean if, if, you, if you're in boxing and you're into boxing you know I, I like hearing their views and opinions it doesn't it doesn't very rarely sway my opinion but i like to hear other people's views what about fred talks fighting do you like that one which one do you like fred talks fighting do you like that one <laughs> of course that's your favorite one that's your favorite one and just of course i uh, just one last point on the matter um do you think there be should do you think there should be a world um governing body that kind of covers all of this rather than kind of promoters and that lot having all too, bit, too much power. Absolutely. But I think throughout the sport, from even through the amateurs, you know, because I, I was involved in the amateurs for a long time and the things that happened to the amateurs, honestly, I, I have to honestly say maybe it might be worse. Um, there's so much that goes on and if there was one governing body governing everything, I'm not saying it would fix all the problems, but at least there would be a guide. You know, if there was a guide and set rules throughout the sanctioning bodies, you know, a lot of times you wouldn't be able to play these kind of games. So, but, um, you know, listen, it's something else to talk about, isn't it? So, life's never simple, never straightforward. That's true. It certainly isn't straightforward. And you heard the kind of the news about amateur boxing being removed from the Olympics. You heard about that? I heard about that. Um, but again, my views on, uh, there's an old video uh, years ago uh, I can't remember what year it was, but it, I, I got asked the question when I was actually in amateur boxing and uh, it was a large meeting um, because two of the organisations, um, they decided to have a split with amateur boxing with um, like ABC. And uh, you know, I think one group was called the Alliance, one was called England Boxing, caused a lot of problems. Um, so if you're a, a particular club and uh, let's say you box for a club that's associated with England Boxing, you couldn't fight for a club just associated with the Alliance. So a lot of times the tournaments were condensed, you know, there wasn't the same, you know, talent pool uh, because, you know, everything we got fragmented and uh, I had strong views on that. I didn't like what was happening. Um, we were part of it um, because we had boxers that came from other clubs, wanted to join us. And then we were almost forced into a situation where we had to choose. Um, which would have meant that some of the boxers that come to us would, would want to leave because they wanted to be involved in particular tournaments like the Karen Gay Box Cup, for example. You know, that's with England Boxing. Um, so that caused a problem. So what we did, and we were the only club at the time that did it, uh, we decided to have two, two boxing clubs at, at our gym. Um, one was called IQ Boxing Club, the other was called Neasden Boxing Club. So we had boxers from England Boxing, boxers from the Alliance cause a lot of problems but we you know me and my business partner Nick we stuck to our guns and you know we had that going for about a good three four years and we were able to enter all the tournaments um so again you know that shouldn't have been really allowed to happen you know uh same with the with the with the head guards 
I boxed. Uh, everybody prefers to box a head guard who doesn't. But when you're a novice and you're learning, the head guard is a safety aspect for boxing. A lot of guys are in tournaments, maybe even a three day tournament, and they get into a head clash and obviously they're out of the tournament. Now, if they were in a head guard, a lot of times it would have helped because you have to understand when these guys are learning to box, a lot of guys don't know where to put their head when they finish punching and so on and so forth. That's why their head guard is there, you know, so you don't get as much facial damage while you're learning. But they strip the head guards um, for all boxers that were um, seniors. So from 18 onwards, you weren't, you did not have a head guard. Even if you had five fights, you were boxing without a head guard. I didn't understand it. I made it clear that I didn't like it. And again, you've got professional boxing, you've got amateur boxing. They're different. They're two different sports. Why try and make amateur boxing look like professional boxing when it's not? You know, there's a lot of things that guys need to learn through the amateurs. That's why we're there to protect them. So, um, yeah, I, honestly, a governing body, governing everything would help, definitely. But it won't happen. Yeah. Too much money in boxing. It won't happen. Yeah, that was my question. I was going to say, to be able to happen, you answered it there. And do you think yeah. the reason why they took away the head guards and amateur boxing when the fighters could turn a senior at 18 plus is to kind of make it more, being more attractive to the public eye since it's been very more stoppages, more knockouts, make it more exciting? You think that's one of the reasons they did it? Well, well, there was some. I mean, there was a lot of talk in regards to how much damage you're actually receiving with the head guard on. They were saying that you're receiving more damage with the head guard. Um, but you have to bear in mind these are amateur boxers. A lot of them haven't learned to sit down on their punches yet, and uh, you know they're wearing quite padded ten ounce gloves. So again, that didn't make any sense to me um so no, i think to make it more attractive i understand why it would do that it's amateur boxing make it look like amateur boxing you know you have a bunch of guys who are novices like green you know coming in for exchanges and then boom in bad cuts and when you get a really bad cut like a really long cut it stays you for your whole career for your whole career you know it just some some cuts you never recover from they'll just reopen even if they They've had time to heal. Internally, there's still problems there. Now, why would you want to go and get a bad cut to learn boxing as an amateur and then have to deal with that cut later on in the pros? It doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's a very good point about the cuts there. That is uh, very, very annoying. But, Xavier, I've taken, too, I've taken a few minutes of your time today. Thanks so much for it. But it's now about need about 2.25 from my clock down here. So what do you got going on for the rest of the day? <laughs> Honestly, all I'm thinking about is uh, is my schedule for this this year. You know, this year is going to be um, really busy. Um, got a lot, lot of pressure at the moment. Uh, I think first up, Julio Chavez Campbell. I think he's out in February. Uh, Dennis Wahom is out maybe March or April. Yusef Kamari, who's had a glory last year. He'll be out again um, around March time. Obviously, Dillian, we're hoping around March time. Um, Kay Prosper, who just boxed uh, his last fight was against Sandor Martin, who went on to beat Mikey Garcia. Um, hoping to get Kay out in a big fight, hopefully March, April. So my schedule is looking heavy. And on top of that, I want to oversee, along with the, um, the other head coach, my business partner, Nick, uh, the amateurs, because I'm very excited about the guys that I've got coming through. Next. Um, I put so much years into them. It's I can't wait for for them to gain so I'm gonna see exactly what we've been spending so long building. You know, I've been very fortunate to, you know, to get good fighters, you know, great fighters. Um, you know, but I'm really excited about the guys that are coming up. They're, that's what I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, and seeing how they how they get on in the pros. So um a couple of them are gonna get are gonna be coming out this year as well. So yeah, it's gonna be a heavy, heavy schedule, but the rest of my day will be studying boxing as usual. What fights are you gonna to watch in the first today then? What you got lined up on YouTube? Oh, pro- I'll, I'll probably watch Holyfield beat Michael Dokes for the 500th time. Um, uh, I'm going to watch Lennox Lewis against Ray Mercer again. Uh, I don't know how many times I've watched that fight. Um, Ivan Robertson against Arturo Gatti. I'm probably going to watch that again. And one of my favourite fighters, uh, Harrison, Tony Harrison against uh, Charlo, uh, especially the second fight. Probably going to watch that again for the 100th time. <laughs> but that's what I just like doing because Every time I watch those fights, I see something slightly different. So it's, it's 
not just me enjoying watching it it's because I'm you know I'm constantly studying keeping my brain stimulated you know and trying to just stay on top of the sport that um that I love and I'm into of course there any fights you can watch then from the 90s and early 2000s no I've watched every like too many fights Yuri Boy Campus Fernando Vargas Michael Carbajal Vic Gonzalez I've just watched that's my error I need to get more up to speed with more current boxing. I don't mean in terms of actually knowing who's coming up and who my fighters are going to fight. That's different. I'm talking about studying. Like, like the current boxers, I don't spend enough time studying them. Um, you know, I'm talking about the new guys coming through. Um, I like to try and spend some time doing that. But, you know, the style that I was taught to box is very much 90s. So that's why I'm, I just gravitate towards that era. Well, I'm only the time machine can go back in time, though, pretty nice, and you watch it live ringside. But Xavier... I think I, I think I need to. I think I need to. I, I can't remember actually made a comment the other day. Some, someone in camp made a comment and said that how acting is... Um, <laughs> he didn't use the word redundant, but he did say it's like it's, it's a bit old. He said boxing's moved on since then. I know you do things like the way you do things, but he said boxing has moved on. I find it very hard to move forward. And the real, the, my honest opinion, and it's no disrespect to any current fighter, you're not as good as the fighters from the 90s. You're not. Really? The guys Why from the 90s, to me, I, they're technically so much better. They're technically so much better. The likes of Tommy Hearns, Sean Marvin Hagler, you know, the, even Floyd started from the 90s. They're fundamentally better. Van der Holyfield is scientific in what he does. Riddick Bowe, one of the best heavyweights of all time. Just technically, when I look at these guys and look at the guys today, today's guys are very, very good, but those guys are outstanding. And so that's that's where my, my learning and education comes from, is from them. I have I'm yet to see someone as good as those guys. I'm still waiting. Even though I really like, I really am a big fan of uh, Crawford. I don't think Crawford's as good as those guys, but I think he's very, very good. Spence is very good, you know, but my error is my error. And I've been stuck in that for a long time. It's not going to change now. I'm basically 50 now. It's too late. <laughs> too late. It's never too late to change, but Xavier, I'm sure we'll catch up. <laughs> we'll hear some more news. I'm sure we'll catch up there, but thanks so much for time and have a nice day in Portugal. And I think it's, it's yeah, I like, England. I, I like what you're doing. I like what you're doing. You know, it was a, a pleasure meeting you. And um, yeah, you know, um, I'll keep tuning in. Awesome. Thanks, Xavier. I'll catch up soon then, mate. Thank you.